but today we're in Daniel chapter 4, and as we step into the chapter, uh, from chapter 3, just to give you some context, to chapter 4, there's about 30 years between the two chapters. So that gives you an idea of the time frame now. And Nebuchadnezzar reigned in Babylon for 43 years. And chapter 4 covers about a four-year time period. Daniel, who came as uh, one who was captured during the Babylonians uh, coming against Israel, came into Babylon when he was about a teenager, maybe 15, 16. At this time, in Nebuchadnezzar's life and in Daniel's life, Daniel would be around 50 years old. So that's the time frame. Daniel's 50 years old. Uh, there, there's, there's this testimony that's going to come out of chapter 4 about Nebuchadnezzar. And this is, in many ways, if, if you're kind of tracking with the context and the, the, the chronology of Daniel, this chapter 4 is Nebuchadnezzar's swan song. After this, you don't hear of Nebuchadnezzar anymore. It's, it's his final words. This is our last look at the one I would call a dreamer. He has these dreams. This is one that is very bloodthirsty. He's very powerful, very dominating, the king of Babylon. At this time, the ruler, historically proven, the ruler of the known world at that time. But after this chapter, he's gone. He's finished. Chapter 2, as you remember, he had this dream, this image of a, of a gold head and a chest and arms of silver and this great vision that Daniel interprets for him. And when he does, Nebuchadnezzar marvels and he praises the God of Daniel and the God of the Jews. And then in chapter 3, you have uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into a fiery furnace. And instead of being consumed, they step out unharmed. And once again, Nebuchadnezzar honors and extols the God of Daniel and of the Jews. And so he has seen, Nebuchadnezzar has seen, the power of the God of Daniel, the God of the Jewish faith, the wisdom that God has given to Daniel, the, the, the supernatural and superiority power of the one true God. And it's beyond anything that Nebuchadnezzar has ever witnessed in his whole life. And now before he exits, before we see him no more, so to speak, in the book of Daniel, we see an even more amazing experience between Nebuchadnezzar and the one true God. So, so Lord, as we open this chapter, we, we ask that you would not only reveal yourself to Nebuchadnezzar, but to us. May we see you as you truly are. May we recognize the one true God of heaven. And may you speak to us through your word. And, and may it not be just something we hear, but may we respond to it with our heart and our lives and our actions. Lord, we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 1 of chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar, the king. And I would underline the word the king because at this time, at this place in history, he is the king of all the world, ruling, powerful, there, there's no equal to him, uh, he's dominating, he's a leader, and, and it says to all peoples, this is why it says this, he's the king, to all peoples, all nations and languages that dwell in the earth, that's who he rules over. And so he says something interesting, peace be multiplied to you. Everything that follows after this has to do with Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. And he wants the world to know what happened between him and the one true God. And, and he, he says, peace be multiplied to you. And, and, and I think the reason he says peace be multiplied to you is because for the first time in his life, Nebuchadnezzar, based on this story, this, this account that we're about to read, he has true peace in his life. And it's pretty hard to, re, to, to, to 
wish other people peace if you have no peace yourself. And he has it. Much different than what we've seen from Nebuchadnezzar up to this point. He's not been at peace. He's been threatening He's been throwing people in the fiery furnaces. He's been telling his own astrologers and sorcerers, if you don't give me the right answer, I'll chop you into pieces. I'll I'll burn your houses down. So something has happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Look what he says. In in verse 2, this is his, his whole purpose for writing this, for saying this. I thought it good. If you were taking notes, you'd say, okay, here's his purpose. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the most high God has worked for me. He says, I want to share with you my testimony, what God has done in my life. And so he begins this story, this this thing that happened to him. How great are his signs, verse 3. He's seen mighty miracles. And how mighty his wonders, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. So he's, he's seen God reveal himself through, through, through Daniel interpreting his dreams to the Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. But, but the greatest miracle of, for Nebuchadnezzar, and probably for you and I, is that God finally opens his eyes to who God really is. But he has to use some interesting methods to do so. And and maybe you're here today and God's been doing some things in your life, which he will do to open your eyes to who God really is. Not to who you want him to be, not to who you might wish him to be or think him to be, but who he really is. And this is what happens to Nebuchadnezzar. Jesus once said this, to his disciples. He says, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man, which Nebuchadnezzar was beyond rich, for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's poetic language to say, rich people, strong people, famous people tend to be proud. They don't recognize their own needs. They're, they're, they're independent. And many times they feel no reason or purpose for God in their life. But here's a picture. I I would paint this picture like this of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is a powerful man in the world, the most powerful man in the world, and God is pulling him through the eye of a needle. And it's a powerful experience. Took a lot to wake up Nebuchadnezzar. In verse 4 it says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house, And flourishing in my palace. He he says, two things were going on in my life. At home, everything was great and wonderful. And in my palace, everything was great and wonderful. I was at rest at home and I was flourishing in my palace. Everything was going my way. He was on top of the world. And he wants us to know, as he's writing this out, that, that, that his story, he wants to be Crystal clear, communicating that he's in a great place, that everything was good, both at home, both at work. He was on top of the world. He, he, he was over the most powerful empire that had ever been on the face of the earth. And then something happens. I saw a dream, verse 5, which, which made me afraid. And the thoughts on my bed and visions of my head Trouble me. You're, you're no longer at rest. You're no longer flourishing. In fact, that, that word there, troubled me, is an interesting Hebrew word that, that actually means it terrified me. Therefore, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon. Oh, no, here we go again. I want these guys to interpret it for me that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. The magicians, verse 7, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, they all came in. Now this time I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. He tells them the dream, and either they can't interpret it or most people believe they did not want to interpret it because it's 
a very simple dream to interpret. They, they, they probably understood it. But it's bad news for Nebuchadnezzar. And the last thing they want to do is give bad news to this man who's so powerful and so proud. So they pass the buck, so to speak, to Daniel. We'll, we'll, we'll let Daniel handle this. And so in verse 8, at last Daniel came before me, Nebuchadnezzar says. And he uses his name Belshazzar according to the name of my God. Part of that name, the bell, has to do with one of the gods that Nebuchadnezzar worshipped. He gave him that name. In him is the spirit of the holy God, and I told him the dream before him, and then he tells it. I know the spirit of the holy God is in you. No secret troubles you. Explain to me the vision of my dream that I've seen and its interpretation. And these were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth. It was height, was great. It grew, it became strong, it reached the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. It was visible to everybody. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and it was... Food for all, the beasts of the field found shade, the birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. So he has this giant tree that he sees, that, that everyone can see, that, that, that is massive and benefits everybody. And in verse 13 he says, I, 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 I saw the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher. A holy one coming down from heaven. And many believe that's an angelic being that God had sent. And he cried aloud and said thus, chop down the tree, cut off its branches, strip off its leaves, scatter its fruit, let the beast get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and its roots in the earth. Bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him gaze, graze with the beast on the land, on the grass of the earth. Now it transitions here. It's interesting. But because it says, bound with a band of iron in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heavens. And then it says, and let him. It goes from an it to a him. A person. And I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar recognized that that tree becomes a him, a beast. No longer a tree. Let his heart, verse 16, be changed from that of a, to that of a man. And let him be given a heart of a beast. And let seven times pass over him. Se seven times a man now lives on the level as a beast, an animal. He becomes like an animal for seven seasons. Many say this is for seven years. A long time. The watcher decrees. This decision, verse 17, is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones. And here's why. Here's the reason. In order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whoever he will and sets over it the lowest of men. In other words, two great principles. God can do whatever he wants to do. He's God. And you're not. And neither is Nebuchadnezzar. Now, not everyone believes in God. Nebuchadnezzar has, has recognized that there is a one true God. But, but there is a God who has ultimate Authority who makes decisions, who tells us what's right is right and what is wrong is wrong. And many times due to pride or position or our, our, our situation in life, people will say, well, I'm like Nebuchadnezzar. I, I don't really have a, a need for God right now. I'm resting and I'm thriving. Who needs God? But here's the deal. Here's this story. God has a way of waking us up to who he is and who he is not. And this is what happens to Nebuchadnezzar. Here comes the meaning of the dream. Verse 18. Th this dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belshazzar, declare it, the interpretation, since 
All the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you're able. For, for the spirit of the holy God is in you. Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was astonished at this time. Now, now let me have your attention. The word astonished is a strong Hebrew word that means to tremble. So, so Daniel understands the vision. He understands what he's about to tell King Nebuchadnezzar, and he's afraid, he's, he's shaking, like, oh my gosh. He doesn't want to go there. He knows what he's about to say. And, and so there in verse uh, 19 of, of, of chapter 4, he, he's trembling. So he, he, he speaks to the king. Do, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you, Belshazzar said to, to Daniel first. Don't worry, I'm not going to chop you up into pieces or burn down your house. My Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you. He's, this is what Daniel says. May it be about your enemies, not about you. And its interpretation concern your enemies. The tree you saw, verse 20, which grew and became strong, whose height reached the heavens and which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and fruit abundant, and which was food for all under the beasts of field dwell, and whose branches the birds of the heaven had their home. It's you, O king. You're the tree. You've grown and become strong, for your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens and your dominion to the end of the earth. And everyone feeds from you, O king. And I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar's got himself dialed in now. I'm the tree. Oh, you're the tree. God speaking to Nebuchadnezzar. And as much as the king saw a watcher, a holy one, verse 33, coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, leave a stump, its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron, bronze, tender grass of the field, let it be wet with dew of heaven and let them gaze with the, graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. Nebuchadnezzar, this is the interpretation. And this is the decree, verse 24, of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord King Nebuchadnezzar, not just a dream or a word from angels. This is from God most high. They shall drive you from men, verse 25. Your dwelling shall be with the beast, and they shall make you eat grass like an oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven. Seven times shall pass over you, and here's why. Till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. It's not all about you, Nebuchadnezzar. It's about the God Most High who has given things into your hand till you know that you're going to be brought down, he says, like an animal. Probably placed in some walled-off area, some protected area. He, he won't be running the country, but, but he will come back. And after seven years of being an outcast. And, and this is written for many reasons. One, because Nebuchadnezzar wants people to know why he's gone for seven years. This is how deep his pride and corruption is. It takes seven years to wake Nebuchadnezzar up to who the one true God is. Seven years for Nebuchadnezzar to respond to God's correction. How long did it take you when God began to knock, when he began to call, when he began to reveal himself to you? How long did it take you before you finally said, oh my gosh, I need the Lord? What, what kind of circumstances came into your life that sort of made you realize, you know what? I really don't have it all together. I mean, think about seven years. Lots happened in the past seven years, hasn't it? That's a long time. I mean, I think back seven years ago, I mean, 2016, Donald Trump was elected president. No one thought that was going to happen. I mean, when it was going on in 2006, I was in Israel at that time with a group, and, and that night I couldn't go to sleep because I was dialed into the news. Trump was, was they, were, they were giving all the results from the election. And I thought, oh my gosh, Hillary's not going to win. Thank God. <laughs> but Trump is. 
the world's coming to an end. And, and then the Cubs won the World Series. I thought the world is coming to an end. This whole thing's crazy. It was just nuts. And, and then from then on, how many know since that point things have been crazy? Biden got elected next. Anything, anybody remember COVID? Inflation off the charts, climate change, Black Lives Matter, Roe versus Wade overturned, Iran, it's all that's going on in Israel and the Ukraine, the, 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 the shootings in our country just off the charts, children have been lost. I mean, on and on it goes. Seven years is a long time and a lot can happen. And Nebuchadnezzar is out of the picture for seven years. You, you think it would take one day if God turned you into a beast. He's already reached out to him in the first dream and a fiery furnace and, and now another. And, and, and he just ran through every one of those red lights. I don't care. I'm, I'm, I'm the king. I'm Nebuchadnezzar. And I want you to hear this. I want you to know this. God is not the bad guy in this story. Well, man, how could he do that to Nebuchadnezzar, turn him into an oxen and have him out in the field? This is how much God values a man's heart and a man's soul that he's willing to put him in a place like that to wake him up to what's real. God has a way of waking us up and he'll, he'll use what's ever at his disposal to do so. And he does what's necessary to get our attention. It's to cause us to, to come to ourselves and, and to, to look to him. It's kind of like the story of the prodigal son. Goes to his father, proud and haughty and young. Hey, I want my inheritance. I'm going to take it. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And he ends up how? Like an animal. Living in a pig pen. And he finally it, it realizes, you know what? I'm not sufficient for myself. I'll, I'll go back to my father. So Daniel tells him the bad news, but, but he also gives him hope. Let's go back to chapter 4, verse, verse 26. And as much as they gave the command to leave the stump in the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Here's what you need to do. Stop your sinning. Break off sins by, and be righteous. And your iniquities by, here's what you not only stop all this terror, but show mercy. And perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. If you'll stop being so brutal and cruel and self-absorbed and start doing some things that are good. Don't just stop, but also do. Maybe God will lengthen your time. And all this, verse 28, came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. And at the end of 12 months, just one year after Daniel gave him the interpretation, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. And he spoke, Is not this great Babylon that I have built? For a royal dwelling for by my majesty and power. For the honor of my majesty. I, 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 me, me, my, my. And while the word, verse 31, was still in the king's mouth of how great he was, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has now departed from you. And they shall drive you from men and your dwelling and shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like an oxen and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Last words he hears. You're now become a beast. From the greatest to the lowest. And I would want to just say this as a side note. That if you live your life without recognizing where it came from and what God has done for you through his son Jesus Christ, how you're made in his image and that you could be born again and become a new creature in Christ, 
to have his love and his forgiveness and his spirit and his word giving you a path to walk in. To, uh, it, without that, I would say for the most part, you do live like an animal. By the lust of your flesh, by the pride of life, by, by just, you know, in, in some way, just, just gratifying yourself however you see fit. You might be talented, you might be rich, you might have everything going for you, you might be at rest at home and thriving in your business, but without the Lord in your life, without acknowledging who the one true God really is, well, for the most part, you live like an animal, by the lust of your own flesh, by your own desires. I mean, take a look at the country that we live in over the, over the last several decades, how we've pulled God out of our colleges and out of our school system and, and out of our culture. And, and look where we are, We're living like animals. It's crazy the world we live in. We, we see the impact in so many ways, uh, the, the, the confusion over, you know, sexual gender and, and the lack of respect for life and authority. It's just, it's bizarre what's happened. So, so Nebuchadnezzar, be, because you don't recognize who the one true God is and, and who really rules over all things, I'm going to give you seven years to think about it. And that very hour, the word was fulfilled. And look what it says. He was driven from men, verse 33. He ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with dew. His hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Now, now scholars have, have come up with an image that they think might look a bit like him. I'm going to throw it up here on the screen. Just... <laughs> who, who is that? Who? With a crown on his head. I don't know what Nebuchadnezzar looked. Probably not like that, but it's a, it's a, it's a stupid thing to throw up there. <laughs> now, at the end of the time, verse 34, I, Nebuchadnezzar, after seven years, I lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me. And here's what I did. I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. An act of submission. An act of recognition. He finally looks up. And this is what happens with everyone, I think, who finally comes to the Lord. There's something higher. There's something greater than myself. And nothing truly makes sense in this world until you recognize that there is a God and who, has, who offers you life and understanding. And the first thing he does is he, he praises him, he, he blesses him, he, he honors the Lord. It's, it's a great response. For his dominion is everlasting and his kingdom from generation to generation. And all inhabitants, verse 35, of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? God, you are God. You're, you're in charge. You, 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 your, your will be done, not mine. And Lord, may your will be a part of my life. And finally, Nebuchadnezzar lets God rule. And at the same time, verse 36, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles res resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom. And excellent majesty was added to me. Almost like he was added more than he had before. And he wants all of us to know. Listen as the last verse. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, Praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all of whose works are truth, all his ways just. And those who walk in pride, well, he is more than able to put down. He's not bitter. He's not blaming God. God, look what you let happen to me. He, 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 he wants all to know. He's not looking for pity. He's saying what God did was just what I needed. 
to take me off my little throne. And, and these are his last words. He, he now disappears from the pages of the Bible. And certainly we see that Nebuchadnezzar is a changed man. But, but what a testimony God gave Nebuchadnezzar. And I want you to hear this. We're, we're almost done. As a believer, if you're here today and you're a Christian, we all have a chapter four of Daniel in our lives. We all have a testimony of I, I once was this, then I came to Christ, and this is who I am now. And this is Nebuchadnezzar. And, and part of our testimony, and we'll, we'll close out the service with this in just a minute, part of our testimony is recognizing that God so loved me that he, that he interrupted my life. I don't know how he interrupted your life, but he, he has a way of interrupting all our lives and saying, hey, now what are you going to do? I remember me, I was like 18 years old, trying to break into the surf world with my older brother who was having great success, and I thought, well, he's not that great. <laughs> I had moved to this area, I was surfing in contests, and I got sidetracked by drugs and by just fun. And, 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 and my brother was disciplined enough to keep, keep his nose clean and, and winning contests. I was just partying and stuff. And, and, and I was, okay, I'm out. I dropped out of high school. I thought I was going to be this surf guy. This is not happening. And then my girlfriend broke up with me. Imagine a girl breaking up with me. <laughs> How could this happen, God? And, and the Lord just began to kind of shake. But what I didn't know was that God said, look, I, I, that's your brother's path. I have a different path for you. I'm taking you to Bible college and seminary. I'm going to send you back to your little hometown. You're going to start a church. When I had no idea. But what I did know was I wasn't capable of navigating and making my life to be at rest at home and to thrive in what I wanted to do. So God had to shake my cage a little bit. And then he revealed to me that he had a plan. And part of his plan was that I might come to know him through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And you know what? We all have a testimony. We, we all have a Daniel chapter 4 in our life where God somehow arrested us and said, it's not all about you, dude. There's a God in heaven, and I've got a wonderful plan for your life. And part of that plan includes my son, Jesus Christ.